There has not been much rain and little snow this winter watering the ground. Southern exposure comes with perks. But the low angle of the sun, together with the steepness of the slope and a relatively thin layer of soil, also comes with challenges in the garden. This is where terracing comes in. I not only enjoy the physical process of making them, but terraces have five major benefits on a mountainside. The first and most obvious is that it makes the land easier to cultivate. But there are more significant things. The sun is at its most forceful when perpendicular to a surface. Terraces flatten the angle. The ground will not warm as quickly, and in winter this is desirable because the ground will stay protected longer by a layer of snow. Terraces can also increase soil depth, important in places like mine where solid rock is not far below. I cannot get this soil from outside. I have to build it, which is done with organic matter. Just clearing the road and pathways by collecting leaves in the fall provides me with mountains of material. Having soil rich in organic content also helps with water retention, as does the terrace itself, which slows the runoff as the rain comes down, letting it seep in. Next, dry walls are a great habitat for a whole range of creatures. Not all desirable as neighbors, but all having their place in God's garden. The fifth benefit is that their walls provide a sheltered microclimate. Protected from the wind and being warmed by the stones in the sun, some plants may thrive that otherwise wouldn't. My gigantic laurel is a great example. So terraces are great, and I really enjoy tiring myself out building them. I have about 50 fruit-bearing species in the garden now. I'm always looking for new things that could work at my location. And some I just try out. Pond 2 is getting some more diversity. In the sheltered area that I call the beach, I've had a device measuring the temperature for the last two years to get an idea of what I might get away with. The low quad is a little risky, but in theory it should work. We'll see. Growing up in the country, I've built ponds probably since I was about eight years old, with varying success, but always with great enthusiasm. Here in this terrain, it cannot be a natural pond for obvious reasons. It needs a liner. But still, it adds so much life to this little patch of land. Life that came on its own. And it catches the rainwater from the roof which, from the pond, overflows into my garden water reservoir for the future drip lines that will feed the Wallapini.
Well, it had to happen. It always does in April, and sometimes even in May. It did not get too cold though, so I hope the apricots and peaches will make it. It won't last long now. The sun will be back in a few days and it has a lot more strength now.
When it comes to building something, I'm not really living in the land of the free. There are certain rules that apply. Talking to my geometer, I found that I was allowed to dig ditches, build drywalls, construct raised beds. I can stack earth bags to have a platform on which to later put water barrels. All of this garden work is no problem. I'm also allowed to set up a greenhouse. But the stipulation is that it is seasonal and movable. In my case, the seasons are inverted. It is not a greenhouse from spring through fall, but from fall through spring. After the initial documentation and recording of the temperatures in a period that we'll also spend this coming summer, the idea is to take the greenhouse down during the hot months. It will prevent overheating, expose the plants to rain, and allow free access for beneficial insects. This whole idea brings challenges to the design process. I wanted the wooden construction to be modular, easily removable with no or minimum use of tools, and the pieces to be storable. I also needed a covering that insulated well in the winter and could sustain some snow load, mostly where it collects at the bottom of the steep pitch. In the end, solar wrap, not a sponsor, seemed a great fit. The flexible sheets just slide in and can be taken out in a few seconds. They can be rolled up for easy storage. What is more unlike regular plastic film, they have an exceptionally long lifespan. Their greenhouses decked with it that are still going after 20 or 30 years with minimal loss in light transmission. This is only one advantage over polycarbonate. Another is that solar wrap lets UV rays pass, making for healthier plants. Anyway, I thought it was a great fit and went for it. Since my wooden construction is not of optimal precision, the great timber is not always straight, it took minutes rather than seconds to install, but that is not a deal breaker.
I went to a place that recycles truck trailer coverings. I think with these thick sheets, I can conjure up something for the backside of the Wallapini.
May is the month with the most precipitation in this part of the Alps. After dry winter, the rains are welcome, even if they're a little early. Not everything real is quantifiable. One may say otherwise, but that is not because it is such, but because it is claimed to be such. And it certainly does not follow from science. Empirical science, that which people typically call science, has chosen methods and tools. These, for very good reasons, exclude some aspects of reality and limit themselves to the quantifiable. To then claim that there are only things that are quantifiable would be like choosing all green teddy bears from an array of colorful teddy bears and later go on claiming that green teddy bears are the only teddy bears that exist. This can be done, of course, but it is hardly reasonable. Even the underlying claim that only those truths that stem from the natural sciences are true is self-refuting, because that claim is itself not demonstrable from the natural sciences. Materialism, naturalism or physicalism are positions that can be held. But we have to understand them for what they are, ideological positions. That is, they start with an idea of the world, with a story of the world. As all stories, they paint images and draw on emotions. Take this, for example, from the philosopher and theorist Herbert Spencer. He was convinced that the sheer size of the solar system should overawe our understanding of man as a spiritual creature. Forget the solar system, look at the cosmos. The infinite vastness of space makes man and all he does insignificant. That is a story. It paints an image and seeks to evoke an emotion contrasting largeness with significance. One of my favorite authors, G.K. Chesterton, responded to this with his usual wit. Why should a man surrender his dignity to the solar system any more than to a whale? If mere size proves that man is not the image of God, then a whale may be the image of God. A somewhat formless image, what one would call an impressionist portrait. It is quite futile to argue that man is small compared to the cosmos, for man has always been small, compared even to the nearest tree. Chesterton goes on in the same chapter of his book Orthodoxy, asking why we should even speak of the universe as particularly large. He says, There is nothing to compare it with. It would be just as sensible to call it small. A man may say, I like this vast cosmos, with its throng of stars and its crowd of varied creatures. But if it comes to that, why should not a man say, I like this cozy little cosmos with its decent number of stars and as neat a provision of livestock as I wish to see? One is as good as the other. They are both mere sentiments. It is a sentiment to rejoice that the sun is larger than the earth. It is quite as sane a sentiment to rejoice that the sun is no larger than it is. A man chooses to have an emotion about the largeness of the world. Why should he not choose to have an emotion about its smallness? The fact that something is large or small has no bearing on its significance. The tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments were infinitely smaller than Mount Horeb from which they were cut. Yet the ideas they contain were so large that they spanned the world. People have said that not only the size of the cosmos, but the randomness of where we are in the universe, this average galaxy with its average number of stars, proves that humanity is unimportant. But this is the same mistake. It is making an ideological assumption. It is just 
a framing of a story. Think of your favorite story. There might be things in it that are completely random, or at least random given the laws of the universe in which the story takes place. That Phidias Fogg wore a particular tie on a particular day may have no bearing on the story of his journey around the world in 80 days, other than illustrating the general laws that govern dress in a particular culture and era, making us sure he wore a tie. But the tie is accidental. There may also be things that seem random and unimportant at a given time, but that at a later point are revealed to rule the fate of many, to cite the words of Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings, alluding to a gesture of pity that would come in the end to determine not only the fate of the protagonists, but of the whole age. That is to say, stories neither lose their meaning because they include aspects that are random to the story itself, aspects that may be simply owed to the laws that govern its universe. Nor can they be reasonably claimed to have no meaning because maybe the vantage point of the reader on page 50 simply does not yet enable him to discern the meaning of a seeming random circumstance that will come to bear only on page 300. If both of these things are true of human stories, why would it be absurd to venture that they are true of the story of humans? Again, you can tell yourself that size invalidates meaning, but you would not be spitting facts or presenting hard truths you would simply be telling a story, a bleak and some would say unimaginative story, but a story nonetheless. So what is the story of the tiny creature that is man in this very large cosmos? And does it matter? <laughs>